open, if you will, this morning. We're going to kind of go back and clean up a little bit of some of what we ended with last week. Um, I told you I went an hour and a half last week. It was an hour and 15, uh, 12 minutes, so I was, uh, I, you, I owe, you owe me 15, okay? Just, <laughs> just kidding. And yeah, it is, isn't it? So, yeah. But uh, I want to go back this morning and talk with you about the dispensation of the fullness of times. And the reason I want to do this is that there is hardly no, no one talk, teaches about this, talks about this passage, looks at this issue. And I just want to kind of get, uh, and again, I'm not going to hit every detail, okay? It may seem like it. You may go, oh my goodness, but this, we're just going to skim that surface again, give you some areas maybe for you to look at, Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10, that's where we need to be. And then for you, and again, this is part of the God's glory plan. We did the rest of the story last week. This is what's going to be out there off of our charts beyond. And, and, when, and it, by the way, when I say that we don't talk about this a lot, a lot of it is because there's not a lot of information in Scripture about this time frame. Verse number 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, that's the Father's will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself, that... Here's the mystery of the Father's will, that he would, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the only one that talks about and uses that term, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, when, whenever we talk about the dispensations, when we talk about time past, but now, and the to come, we talk about characteristics, right? These are the major characteristics. These are the books it covers and stuff like that. Well, we're going to do some of that this morning with the dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay? What is going to, go, what is going to happen? What is one of the major characteristics of the, dis, of the DOFT? Okay? The, the fullness of times. It's given to you in verse 10. What is the major characteristic that's going to happen there? He's going to do what? He's going to put all things back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? That is the major event that's going to happen in the dispensation of fullness of times. Okay? Now, in a little bit, we're going to get over in the book of Revelation, and I'll show you some other characteristics that are going on. But if you'll just, when you think about the dispensation of the fullness of times, when you think about that, if you don't have Paul in your Bible, you have no understanding of what's coming out there in eternity. Or if you come over to chapter 2, verse 7, 2 7, that in the ages to come, you see that word ages is plural? It's not age to come, it's ages. In other words, one age is going to end, and the next one begin, and the next one end, and the next one begin, and this is going to go on for eternity, as we would say. Okay? So the major characteristics of the dispensation of the fullness of time, the first one is that issue that he's going to bring all things in Christ, gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He's going to bring the all things, that governmental structure. We've studied about us in the heavenly places, in the principalities and powers, those seven positions of rank and authority in the government. We looked last time with the nation of Israel in the kingdom where he's going to resurrect David to sit on the throne. He's going to resurrect the 12 apostles to sit on their tw 12 thr thrones. He's going to, the 12 tribes then are going to rule over the Gentile nations as they go into the kingdom. That's all government. One of the major things that the Lord does in His earthly ministry is establish the governmental structure of His kingdom on the earth. Okay? That's one of the major things He does in His earthly ministry. But when you come and you look at this, this title, Dispensation of the Fullness of Times, that's a, such a, that's a regal title. And it's a regal title because this is when the Godhead is on display ultimately. Look over with me real quickly at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter 2. I told myself to stick with my notes. 
I have four pages and double-sided, back-sided, single-spaced. And I told myself, stay on your notes, stay on your notes. But when you start talking about this and teaching about this, there is so much that's gonna, that we learn about now. The godliness is profitable now, but also out there in the to come, that you begin to see it and you begin to put it over there. Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. How? If you want to see the Godhead, who are you going to look to? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the Godhead bodily, the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of everything that the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, is doing, period. But in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the Godhead begins to be exalted as the triune Godhead that they are. The, the Christ is still the head. He's still the king. He's still in those functions. But now, it, instead of just focusing on just him which they really don't. They focus on everybody, but he's the center. Then he begins to focus on everybody. Okay? So the dispensation of the fullness of times. Uh, come back with me to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in Genesis 1. Dispensation, that word. A dispensing of information, right? I looked up the Oxford English Dictionary because that's where all the big boys go to. The act of distributing or supplying something. The dispensation. I like that. The act of distributing. By the way, you go to the pharmacy, you go to Walgreens, and they dispense drugs, don't they? Okay? So dispensing is not an uncommon thing. But or supplying something. Then I looked up that word fullness. I told you Genesis 1, didn't I? Go back to Ephesians 1. Sorry. This is on my notes, yep. <laughs> That's going to be the comment, isn't it? I can hear. It's okay, hold me to them. That's fine. All right? The, that word fullness, by the way, if you notice, the spelling of it is one L, not two. Okay? We've, it's F-U-L, fullness. The state of being complete or whole. The state of being filled to capacity. Isn't that interesting? Fullness. Ephesians 1, verse 23, which is the body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. We're going to spend some time looking at that when we go look at heaven and, and the filling up of everything out there. We haven't done that yet. We're getting there, okay? So that state of being complete or whole, fullness. The day of Pentecost has fully come. It's completed. It's whole. The fullness of times. It's plural, by the way. Time. By the way, time is, is how you measure the duration between two points. How long does it take to go from here to there? But the plurality there, times, that is a, that is a continual progress of stuff, isn't it? We have time past. By the way, we're going to chalk talk, okay? And we have, but now, right? And then we have to come. That's time. That's time. So it's a fullness of times. There's going to be a dispensation out here where time is going to be completed. Now, it doesn't, is it, time is, now go to Genesis 1. Time was created for a reason. It was established for a reason. And what time does in the dispensation of the fullness of time is the dis dispensation. It's where, it's where the, the act of supplying, the act of distributing, the, complete, the purpose of time comes to a conclusion, comes to a completion now, in eternity, it doesn't mean time doesn't exist anymore. What is time? Moving from point A to point B, that duration. We're going to do that for eternity. But there's some times that God has appointed that have to come up complete, done away, done. It's done. And that's what we're talking about. Look at Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God did what? He created. 
heaven and earth. Look at verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the what? For, see how he created time? Day one. Day and night, evening and, and evening and morning. Verse 8, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning, verse 13, were the third day. Verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth. So God created time for a purpose. What is this purpose? To create creation. See that? He has a purpose in his create. He, cre he established time. And he created it so that he could begin to, to accomplish something and to get some things done. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you have a Schofield Bible, but at the top of that page on Genesis 1-1, there's a date. It's called 4004 B.C. Now, I'm going to do this, and we're going to do this quickly. That date comes from a man by the name of James Usher. Now, many years ago, I have his book, The Chronicles of the World, Annals of the World History, something like that. And I, did some I, did, I spent some time researching him, studying out. He, he, is the, he is the primo time guy for the Bible, okay? He was born in 1581 in Dublin, Ireland. He died in England in 1656, but he spent his life, okay, he's an old man, long time ago, back when they studied stuff to study, to know, and to do. There wasn't a money in it. There wasn't a popular. They were wanting to know that science of knowledge. He preached against, well, where did he go? He wrote, he, he preached against, uh, the uh, what, um, Usher wrote wildly on Christianity in Asia Minor, on Ep Episcopacy, and against Roman Catholicism. Okay, he did. He hated the established religion. He he would be a guy that would sit in amongst us and be right at home. Okay, and Usher began. He's the one that that said most Bibles use him as his dating. I'm going to use James Usher. If you got a problem with that, it's your problem. Deal with it. Get over it. Fix it for yourself, okay? All right? I did. I did this years ago. Sat with pen and paper, walked down through. Actually, I pulled out the big map here Wednesday night a little bit. We were looking at it, big, big old thing, and, and the timeline and everything. And what generally says is everything starts at 4004 B.C. That's day one, okay? So we're going to use that. Come over to Genesis 15. Now, we're talking about the fulfillment of time, because we're going to get over here to the dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay, you with me? All right. So I'm not going to, Genesis 15. I'm not going to give you every little detail. The numbering isn't going to match up to 6,000 years when we go into the 1,000 years of the millennial kingdom. Okay? My numbers will not do that. They do it on my... My numbers I'm going to give you is just highlight. On my pad, they do. That's why I'm giving you highlight numbers, okay? You sit, you study it down. Maybe I'll pull my pad out one time and we'll spend about six years studying it, okay? But the thing is, is, you know, I got emails, hey, your timing doesn't match this and that. How do you do that? I'm not going to tell. I've done it, all right? If you don't like that, that's your problem. It is not mine, Okay? I'm going to give you some pointers on where to go. And I say that out of all dear sincerity and not vicious or mean or anything like that because I said a minute ago, I get emails, I have critiquers all the time. It gets old. And a lot of it is people that have problems and they don't want to spend the time studying it out. All right? I use James Usher. I rely on him. If you don't like that, then we'll see you next Sunday. I'm sorry. Okay? Now, got all that out, right? Genesis 15. Genesis 15, God talks to Abraham and is going to make a covenant with him. All right, 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it for him, to him for righteousness. There's Abraham's justification. All right, Abraham is a justified man, Romans 4, Galatians 3, verse 12. Oh... 
Genesis 15, verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And, he's, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, uh, them and they shall afflict them how many years? All right, so we're going to throw, just put 400 years up there. By the way, go back to Genesis 12. Just hang tight here with me. Genesis 12. At the top, in Genesis 12, there's a, there's a 19, uh, top of Genesis 12, there is a number of 2126 B.C., okay? All right? Then in the top of chapter 13, there's a 1920 B.C. See, all right? So, okay, what happened in that time? What you begin to understand is in Genesis 1 through 11 is roughly... 2,000 years of human history in 11 chapters. Okay? Why so fast? Well, because we just needed to get man on board and up and running. From Genesis 12 to chapter 50 is about 500 years. He slows down. Why does he slow down? Because he's talking about very specific stuff now with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's got to spend time there, okay? All right, you with me? How long did Abra was Abraham told his people were going to be down there in Egypt? 400 years. Okay, you got a verse there, right? So from Genesis 12 is 21, 26. Now go to Exodus 1. By the way, does anybody have ushers' numbers? Okay, good. Exodus 1. What's the, the top on Exodus 1 is 1706 B.C. Okay? You with me? I'm going to give them to you if you don't. Don't worry about it. This number minus that number is 420 years. So from Abraham, Genesis 15, to Exodus 1. By the way, who showed up in Exodus 1? Joseph, a king of Egypt, a, a, a usurping of Pharaoh, right? And who showed up? Moses shows up. All right? So from Moses, he shows up. By the way, oh, I keep saying by the way, and I, I apologize for that. Look back at Genesis 15. Because we didn't keep, we didn't finish reading, and get Exodus six. Got to think about this a little bit. Again, you crunch the numbers; they're not going to match because I'm jumping big numbers. Okay, the little guys in between. All right, just I'm heads up, you. Okay, all right. Got Genesis fifteen. We started. We read down through verse thirteen. Look at verse sixteen. Genesis fifteen sixteen. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. You see that fourth generation? Go over to Exodus 6. Exodus 6. Here's the fourth generation. Exodus 6. Somebody take, you've got a calculator. Somebody take... 1913 minus 1491. Got to count. 1913 minus 1491. What do you got? Isn't that amazing? From the decree in Genesis 15 to that showing up of the fourth generation. Is 422 years. This stuff is on time. Because guess who showed up in Genesis 6? Verse number 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Verse 16. 
And, there are, and these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershom and Kohath. You see Kohath there? Verse 18, and the sons of Kohath. See that right there, verse 18, verse 20. And Aram took him, Jokbin, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. You know who showed up in the 422nd year after the promise given to Abraham? Moses did. And Aaron. Right there. My thing is, we got some time. I don't get bogged down in the details in the time. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 6. So, from Abraham to Moses, we've got time. Moses leads out that little exodus. And by the way, how many years did Moses spend on the back end of the desert? Forty. And so you got to know some of this. You already know it. Okay. That's I'm not on the. That's not on the board. First Kings six. First Kings six verse one. You got verses like this all through your scripture. It takes a little study, a little digging, but it's there. First Kings six one. And it came to pass. In the 480 year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Zeph, that's May, which is the second month, that's how you know it's May, first month is April, real scientific brain surgery here, folks. You know what the problem with all this is? You've got to believe it. That's the problem with the book. People don't believe it. You believe it, you've got no problem that he began to build the house of the year. Look at verse 1 there. 480th 80th year. So from the Exodus to David and Solomon building the temple is 480 years. that number look familiar? 480 is a big number all through it. 40. Big numbers through Israel's history. Okay? Now... Let me throw a, something at you. Look over at Acts 13. And this is where you got to believe your book. Acts 13. <clears throat> In Acts 13, the Apostle Paul stands in his first recorded message. And he's going to give a history of the nation of Israel. Okay? And in his history, he's going to give here, he, Acts 13. You start in verse 16. So from Acts 16... I'm, I'm sorry, Acts 13, verse 16 to 23 is the history of the Old Testament. Okay? From verse 24 down through 39 is the history of the New Testament. The Lord Christ, the Apostles, Acts, Paul. Okay? In Acts 13, look at verse 18. Acts 13, 18. And about the time of 40 years... Suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Verse 20. And after that he gave unto them judges about the spaces of 450 years. Verse 21. By the space of 40 years. See that? Verse 22. And talking there about David, about with 40 there with David. Reign of David. It's 40 years. When you add those up, you know what number you come up with? 570. What in the world happened there? See that? So from the Exodus to David, Paul adds 570. Oh, by the way, plus three years for Solomon's reign is 573. Why are those two different numbers? See, now you're, in the, now you're getting in the weeds and studying it. But there's timing is important. By the way, there's 93 years difference between those two. And the reason is the book of Judges. Because when the Judges showed up, God started the prophetic time clock, and when they went away, he stopped it while they were under Gentile rule. Then he started back, and he does that. And guess how many years he does that in the book of Judges? 93 years. So if you take 93 and you back it out of 73, guess what you got? 480 on God's timeline, 570 on the calendar. See how confusing this can get real quick? Now, come to Daniel 9, because we're going to... Sakia again. Again, we're looking at the dispensation of the fullness of what? Times. I want you to see the times. We got times. And again, and I'll be honest with you, we've taught this in understanding Israel studies. I've taught this pieces over through the years. 
But what, you, what I'm trying to get you to understand is God is a God of order and time. And he says out here, major issue, all things, all the government is now set up. It's mine. Now watch Daniel 9. I love Daniel 9. Start in verse 24. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And then he's going to do six things there to them. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that's Nehemiah 2, is going to be seven years, right? And then... Six or seven weeks, sorry, and 62 weeks until the Messiah is cut off, and that's Calvary. Okay, so what do we got there? 69 weeks, but their week is seven years. So if you go 69 times seven, what do you get? 483 years. Okay, no. Yes? Good. Genesis, hold on to Daniel, look at Genesis 29. Hold on to Daniel, Genesis 29, 27. Genesis 29, 27. Folks, I'm not a mathematician, don't profess to be one, but I can understand this, all right? But when you get in there and you start looking at the book, you get the details. Again, take your legal note and just start writing down numbers, man. It all think, think, think. Next thing you know, you realize that by the time that the that Christ Calvary happens, it's been six thousand years, roughly, roughly, on the timeline from day one. And I'll show you that here in just a second. Verse twenty-seven. Fulfill your uh, Jacob here. He. he He's uh, dealing with Haran, and he says, verse 27, Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service, which thou shalt serve with me yet, what? Seven other years. One week equals seven years. How do you know? That verse just told you that. Fulfill her week. How long is her week? Seven years. Okay? Now, we back to Daniel 9. Okay, keep going. Nehemiah 2, by the way, Nehemiah 2, the date on that bad boy is 445 B.C. When the Lord's triumphal entry in the week before Calvary is 33 A.D. 32, 33 A.D. Do you know how many, how long that is? 483 years. Sir Robert Anderson in one of his wonderful books says that that is the divine proto right there. He showed up right when he's supposed to go in. He is the Lamb. Daniel 9 verse 26. Verse, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's going to be the uh, Isaiah 53 8 says that that is Calvary. And he shall, verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's going to be a week over here. Hang on, got to get my, my rag. There's going to be a week over here, the 70th week. Okay, 70th week, right there. All right, you with me? That week, seven years, three and a half years on one side, three and a half on the other, 42 months, 42 months, 120, 1,260 days, 1,260 days. Okay, good? All right, come over to chapter 12, Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Isaiah's cut off, uh, Isaiah, the Lord's cut off. You're in Daniel 12, right? Hold on to that, and let's go to Luke. 
Go to Luke 13. I'm going quickly. You don't know how fast, how much slower I want to go and just spend time with you in the Old Testament showing you all of this and all. Okay, are you with me? You understand what we're doing? We're talking the fullness of times. Look at what's going on here. By the way, with Abraham, what did he establish? And the Exodus. He established his nation, didn't he? They're his people. Luke 13. Look at Luke 13, verse number 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit therein and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come... I'm sorry, I come seeking fruit on this tree and find none. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. For three years, he's been dealing with them. And guess what? By the way, the fig tree is a one of the four trees of Israel. It's talking about their... their um, I just had it. Doggone it. Give me just a second. I got to watch my cheat note. Hang on here. I got them all too here. It's their religious life in Israel, okay? And he goes, I've been looking for them to have works, fruits of righteousness. They got none. All right? Cut it down. Why cumbereth it to the ground? Verse 7. And he said unto him, Lord, let it alone this what? One year, right? So we got the Lord. He buried, rose again, comes back, spends 40 days with the guys. Now we're in the book of Acts, right? From Acts 1 to 7, guess how long that is? One year. At the stoning of Stephen, the nation of Israel falls... And the church, the body of Christ, interrupts this, and Paul sits right in there. You with me? Okay. We're coming across. Time starts all the way down. It's moving. It's clicking. You got 420, 4, 5, 480, 570. You got all these numbers, and you start crunching them in. And you come all the way across there. Go back to Daniel 9. Now, by the way, Romans, the dating in Paul's epistles, when you look at them, you have to remember they're not in chronological order. Go back to Daniel 9 in your Bible. Because he didn't write them that way. He wrote them in a different order. They're in that order. Uh, Daniel 12, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the prophetic program. So when Daniel looks across here, and he sees this time schedule. He doesn't see the year, and he doesn't see the body of Christ. Because the Lord is the one that inserted the year, and God's head kept the mystery the mystery. So he's looking straight across. So literally, you add seven to that, that would be 490 years right there, right? Okay. What started on day one? Sin. Throw that in the back of your head. Okay? Oh, day, not day one, sorry. About, about, about day eight, day, day nine, day ten. Okay? I told you Daniel 12, right? Look, look at Daniel 12. Look at verse 11. Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, the abomination that's going to be taken away, Daniel says, happens in the midst of the week. So from that backwards, you're going to have 1290. You see that extra 30 days in there? Remember I tell you there's 30 days that kind of sit on the each side of that middle of the week events? Because in that time, guess what's got to happen? The war in heaven comes to a conclusion. By the way, we're out. We're up here in the third heaven waiting. We're waiting for that war to get done. You got the Antichrist got to get set. You got a whole bunch of details that got to work out. Okay? Verse 12. What's that first word? Blessed. Where did the blessed show up? In the kingdom, baby. We're blessed. Now keep reading. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to 1,305 and, and 30 days. Isn't that something? 
See, all, you got all this time, don't you? If you take... Twelve sixty and twelve sixty, what do you got? Twenty five twenty, right? Let's see if I did this right. One thousand, one thousand thirteen. Okay. Take that minus twenty six. What do you got? Seventy five. 75 days sits right in there till the blessed go in. Okay? You with? You got that? All right. Come back to chapter 8 of Daniel. Chapter 8 and verse 14. Chapter 8 and verse 14. In the 75 days, right here, David is resurrected. The 12 apostles are resurrected. The 12 tribes are established, and then the Gentile believing uh, believers are brought in to the kingdom. In the kingdom, they're going to do Matthew 28 and go get the rest of the Gentiles. All right? This would be Old Testament if you need a designation. People, they're Old Testament Gentiles. Rahab, she's going to be resurrected into the... I mean, she's a, she's a believer, folks. Come on. Okay? You got Daniel 8. Look at verse 14. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? When does the, when does the sanctuary cleansed? Right here, right? And that's going to be 2,300 days, Right? we got 220 days. The Antichrist is going to cause the temple to be built in 220 days. That's his peace policy. Reestablish the temple worship. See how you got that? Okay, just kind of think about it. All right? Page two. <laughs> no, it's page three. Leviticus 12. Leviticus 12. Again, the fullness of what? Times. How long has this bad boy been going on? I told you Leviticus, didn't I? Shoot, go to Romans 11. I know, just stick something in Leviticus. Romans 11. Romans 11. Okay, now listen to me. Romans 11. Now watch this. Pay close attention to this. Genesis 1 Sin has entered in with Adam and Eve, right? It's been booking all the way down to, the, to Calvary. Daniel says, it's going to, I'm going to have to do this over, it's going to keep going all the way over here. Okay? Romans 11.25, what does Paul say happened? For I would not, brethren, that, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to who? After that, the prophetic time clock quit ticking during the age of grace. If we're 4,004 years before Christ, he's born, now we're over here at 33 AD, right? We're, that's 4,000 years. Roughly. How long have we been going? Well, about, I'd say it again, just under two. Well, four plus two is what? Isn't that interesting? So literally, by the time, I mean, just think about, again, prophetic time clock has quit ticking today. It's interrupted the timeline. That means the stuff that you're seeing happening today is not a fulfillment of the book of the Revelation. You're welcome. Okay? You with me? Now, go back to Leviticus 12. Leviticus 12. I'm on page 3 of my notes, just FYI, okay? And they're not single-spaced. <laughs> 
or on the back. Leviticus 12. In Leviticus 12, you have a picture of the purification of a woman that's just with child. Okay? It's called the law of motherhood. Verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, if a woman hath conceived seed and born a man child. Then she, sh I always thought about, well, what if it's a little girl? Does this count here? I mean, you know, anyway. Then, sh <laughs> then she shall be unclean. How many days is she unclean? Seven days. So we got seven days. Well, six will be out here ongoing. Seven days. Okay? You with me? On the eighth day, that child is circumcised. Right? Then she's going to go for how many more days? 33 more days. Right? Until her purification is done. When you add 33 plus 7, you know what you get? That wonderful number of 40, which is a probation number. It's a number that deals with the issue of purifying and getting stuff right. Sin's been going since the beginning. It's going to travel out seven days. Okay? How, by the way, how long is the intro period to here? A thousand years, isn't it? Yes, Rick. Second Peter 3, verse 8 says, A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day with the Lord, right? One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. Interruption, six thousand. Here's seven thousand. Again, we don't. this is gone going, okay? But if you think about God and what? Time, he's counting this too. See? Okay? So this is only seven years, so that'll fit in day six. Day seven is a thousand, right? So then we're going to have 33 more days out here. So you're going to have end up with 33,000 in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Come back, come over to Deuteronomy chapter seven. So the dispensation of the fullness of time is going to bring to conclusion the whole of God's plan to slow down sin, to then reorganize the earth under Israel, and reorganize the heavenly places out here with the body of Christ. Okay? Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9. I've warned you about the word generation does not always mean time. It also can be mean generate. When he says you, you are of the, this generation and you're vile and you're vipers, who generated them? The devil did. That's their, okay? But here, chapter 7, verse number 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keepeth his commandment to a thousand, what? There it is. Now, think about this. Who is the perfect man? The Lord Jesus Christ. How many years did he live? Oh, look at that. 33. And we're going to go 33,000 years. Are you ready? Go back to Ephesians 1. What's going on in verse 10? That Christ, number one feature of the dispensation of the fullness of times is that what? All things in who? In Christ. Whether they're on the earth, that'll be Israel. Where? In her kingdom. That'll be the heavens. There's the body. In our kingdom. And they all sit under his so he has 
slowed sin, retarded sin as much as he could, and now he has completely reorganized, recaptured, regathered the, na the government back under him. Okay? Now, this is roughly going to be about 7,000 years. This is going to be roughly 7 plus 33 is what? 40. By the way, what happened on the eighth day, do you remember? Got circumcised, didn't he? All right? Hold on to that thought. It's an interesting thought. Come over to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Actually, you know what? Well, I just, I want to get this done. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. In the dispensation of fullness of times, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28 is taking place. So we're going to see the outward working of it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, 24. Let's go there. 15, 24. Then cometh the end. When he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Where does he do that at? Great white throne judgment, folks. He takes death and hell and casts them off in the lake of fire. It is done. By the way, he does it for you and I at our raptured out, <laughs> okay? But he does it for everybody right there. Keep reading. For, uh, verse 27, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him. All things subdued. Remember Fl Philippians 3, change our vile body, that we sub should do it. Subdue all things. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Remember I said out here in the dispensation of the fullness of times, guess what's going to happen? Come over to Revelation 21 quickly. Revelation 21 What's going to happen is the Godhead becomes exalted as who they are together. How do you know that? Well, 1528 just said the Father's the one that's going to, he's doing it there. Revelation 21, Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. When you see that new heaven and new earth? The number eight is the number of a new beginning. So another characteristic, second, first one, is the government of the heaven, the government of the universe is put back under the feet, under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Father gave him. Number two, it's a new, it's a new thing. It's a new earth. It's a new heaven. By the way, if you look back in chapter 20, verse 11 there, guess what the earth and heaven did? They fled away. <laughs> They, they are dealt with. Now you have a new heaven and a new earth. No more container, no, nothing containing sin. Why? Because it's been dealt with here at the great white throne judgment. Okay? So, squiggle line. Sheesh. Okay? Seven days of creation. By the way, on the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. He talks about his kingdom rest. Where's he resting? In the kingdom, baby. Come on, it's right there. Oh, I, I do my Farley run. Come on, let's get it going, right? Revelation 21, 1. Okay, so new heaven and new earth, why? Because the first earth and the first heaven were passed away. 2 Peter 3, quickly. 2 Peter 3, quickly, quickly, quick, 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 quick. quick. 2 Peter 3, you're already there. Verse 5. 2 Peter 3, 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
but the heavens and the earth which are now. So the old world, that's the flood. Now, uh, 2 Peter 3, 5, 6, and 7. Okay? Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are what? Now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. What's the earth and the heaven now reserved to? Fire. Judgment. Okay? Verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these which uh, th these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, godliness, and all you go? Notice what's happening there. There, What's going to happen when the Lord comes back and all this begins to play out? There is a nuclear bomb goes off. That's the closest thing we, you and I can think about where all flesh is burned away, all the elements are done away with. You know what he's going to do? And he's going to do it. He's going to put in suspension all of the believing Gentiles, Israel, the believing, the true Israel of God, he'll put them in suspension. They're in him. It's like you and I being sealed in the whole, with the Holy Spirit. Ain't nobody touching you. You and I are in the heavens. We're in the suspension moment, if you will. Okay? Just, I'm trying to illustrate this. Okay? He gets rid of the old. All of this goes away. And he says, now it's time for new. And he does it without a container, because sin is no more. So you have a new heaven, new. You have a new heaven, the outer, the outer space out there, the, the universe. You have, a, you have an earth, and then down at the bottom of it, you have the lake of fire. Okay? Now, go back to Revelation 21, quickly. Revelation 21. In, in Isaiah 66, well, Revelation 21. Let's do this one real quick here. Look, if you will, at verse 10. Verse 9. And John, John speaking, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. That's the bride, the city of Jerusalem, not you and I. Don't ever let anybody say you and I are. We're the body. Colossians 2.17, where I was going to take you a minute ago, says that the things in the past are a shadow of the things that are to come, but you're the body. <laughs> Don't get caught up in all that garbage. Having the glory, uh, the, uh, the glory of God and her light and so forth. Do you see that city, Jerusalem? It's going to come up out of the third heaven. It's going to come down here and sit on planet Earth. The Holy Jerusalem, that is where, that is the command center of the universe is going to sit on this earth. And you go over there, you take the things over there, and that city literally matches, now think in your mind, take the, the, the eastern seaboard of our country from the top end down to Florida, and then go west all the way to the Mississippi River. That's going to be the city right there. That's how big this bad boy is. And it's the command center of the earth. It's the command center of the universe. And I know what happens. Everybody goes, well, the sun does this and the moon goes that. And that. You know what? It's all going to be gone and dealt with. And the fact of the matter is, is the earth has been since day one. I've decreed my habitation, all those creation verses, to be the earth. The command center. And then out he goes. Now, from verse 2 down to verse number 8, you see a description. Well, really verse 7, verse 6, 7, right in there, verse 6. You would see a description of the fullness of times. The dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay? Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That word tabernacle, what a word. 
tabernacle, to dwell with. What did he, what did, he's Emmanuel. That is what? God with us. He's with you, man. He's with us in heaven. He's with them on the earth. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their people, and God shall wipe away all what? Tears. There's a, there's a characteristic right there. No more tears. And there shall be no more death. Uh-oh, well, boy, we'll talk about that, man. Oh, my goodness. I have that on here. We don't have the time. Time's up. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6, he talks about. The increase of his, you know, the increase of his government in, in Isaiah nine verse six and seven, and it's going to go on and on and on and on. And guess what? There's no death. So you know what's going to happen out here, folks? Earth's going to fill up. Oh my goodness! Now what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, guess what's out there? Little planets, little solar systems, little things like this that he's created. Mars will be inhabitable. Why? Because sin's gone. The curse is gone. He's reorganized it the way he did back in Genesis 1-1. And guess what they can do? They're going to start moving people around. And guess what? They fall in our, con, uh, our, our coordinates. Ah, see, I, I just, man, I wish I had an hour and a half more with you. Because all of this stuff begins to fit. Remember, Deuteron- remember the 24 elders? We talked about that a couple weeks. Okay? And it's going to be those 12 squadrons out there. Well, guess what? If you're on, if you got shipped to Pluto, and Pluto fell, and not you personally, but the Gentiles, you, and Pluto fell in the quadrant of the tribe of Judah's oversight, and, and that was, then that fell in out your oversight as a member of the body of Christ. This bad boy goes on forever. We got 33,000 years to get it set up and figured out. There's no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he, said, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, that's John, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. <whistles> Guess what? The book says it's done. Then when we go on out here, for the ages to come, this will never happen again. Because the time has been fulfilled. It's done. I heard a guy one time say, oh, God's got other books up there. He's got another book about his word and everything. That verse says, no, he does. And I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh, there's your earth. See that? Verse 8, there's the second death, the lake of fire. That sits down here at the bottom end of everything, just as a reminder for man. See what rebellion got you? Remember what rebellion got you. You see, folks, the dispensation of the fullness of times, we started back here, 4004 B.C., we come trucking all the way across here. We live in an interruption of this, of the prophetic picture. But the time is still ticking. Isn't there a song? Okay. 7,000. There it is. Off we go. So come back there to Ephesians 1. I'd say what, folks, you take Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7 and you run with that, and you start running some of the stuff we've already studied in the previous 15 lessons. And you know what begins to happen? I don't have room on the board anymore. You, we end up beginning to fill up these. We're in that, our, our structure is that piece of, that sliver of pie look thing. And we begin to fill up the heavenly places. And as 33,000 years come to an end, actually as that issue of 40 comes to an end, the issue of probation, the issue of restoration from all of man's sin is finally and completely done. It's going to take you 33,000 years to figure out the new body. It's going to take you some time. That bad boy moves, man. I want to go see Phil. I'm right there. Oh, man. Phil. Oh, easy, Bubba. You know? I want to go here. I want to, it's, it makes the Jetsons look like kindergarten. It's right there. It's in your book. Again, you just start ticking the time clock off, and you can do it. My point was to get you from 
beginning to really to hear, okay, in Daniel's schedule. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, we'll close. Ephesians 1, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's the major characteristics of that time. That issue of where he is going to bring to a conclusion, bring to a finality what all of these times we're all about. And that is to get all of this back underneath the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Hopefully that helps you somewhat. Scratch the surface. You can go dig into it. It's, it's amazing. It'll, it takes, this takes you a lifetime. I would encourage you to learn who you are in Christ and live a grace life. And let some of this be just with the Lord and let him figure it out and some of us knuckleheads that look at it, okay? Now, again, I didn't hit every little detail. I just want you to understand the fullness of times. If you pay attention to Schofield and the guys, they've got all these different dispensations all through here, okay? We don't look at it that way. They're there, but we don't look at them that way. But guess what they are? They are times all coming to a completion, a fullness. And you get a little picture in Revelation 21 of what it's going to be like. I just like the no more hurt part, <laughs> the no more pain part. But why? You already have a new body, don't you? Going up. Okay? Hopefully I haven't bored you. This stuff right here makes me run the aisle and get excited. And again, I'll wear a little tighter shirt and a skinnier tie and we'll do the Farley thing. I, I'm all for it. But the thing of it is, folks, is you, this, you understand this, and the nonsense going outside there in the world is nothing but just a little pebble that sits in the bottom of your foot from the seashore and bugs you. That's all that becomes. Because this is so much more, more vast, more vast. We're, I just skimmed the top. Now, next week, I'll tell you, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to look around heaven. We're going to see the creatures that are in heaven that are there now. We're going to enjoy the third heaven. We're going to enjoy what's going on because that stuff's going on right now. Let's bring it back into the real okay, right now, okay? But, folks, you need to understand that when Paul says we walk, by, we walk by faith and not by sight, that's what this stuff is right here. Work it out, okay? I would encourage you to spend a lifetime learning who you are in Christ and living that way. And let the Lord deal with all that. This is fun to know, fun to study. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your Son, for all the spiritual blessings, for the completeness that we have in you, and for everything that you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen.